My name is Anas Shalev, and I'm the director of the UAB Comprehensive Diabetes Center and the professor of medicine, a member of the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Metabolism at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And today I would like to talk to you about efforts uh, that we are on the way of doing in terms of promoting the patient's own beta cell mass to treat diabetes. First of all, we have to remember that loss of insulin-producing pancreatic beta cells is a major problem of both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And even though the pathogenesis is different with autoimmunity playing a major role in the pathogenesis of type 1 diabetes and insulin resistance being involved in the one of type 2 diabetes, both of them ultimately culminate in the beta cell apoptosis or programmed cell death of the insulin-producing beta cell mass. The other thing that we have to remember is that not all beta cells are destroyed in type 1 diabetes, which means that there is still residual insulin production. And that is something that has been really established over the last decades. There have been nice papers by the Harlan group in, back in 2009 already demonstrating that pancreatic beta cell function persists in many patients with chronic type 1 diabetes. And more recently, a group for the, for the Type 1 Diabetes Exchange Clinic Network showed in a diabetes care paper in 2015 the prevalence of detectable C-peptide according to the age of diagnosis. And interestingly, what they saw was that C-peptide was found even five years after diagnosis in almost 80% of patients uh, diagnosed after the age of 18, and even after 40 years after diagnosis in almost 20%. So that means that we don't have to start at zero when we're trying to expand beta cells in even patients that have had type 1 diabetes for quite some time. That led us to try to identify factors that may play a role in causing diabetic loss of insulin-producing beta cells. And to make a really long story short, we initially discovered thyroidoxin interacting protein, or TICSNP, as a top glucose-induced gene in human islets in a microarray analysis where we compared human islets exposed at low and high glucose. We then went on to show that TICSNP levels were also elevated in mouse models of diabetes, both type 1 and type 2. And then more recently found that TICSNP induces beta cell apoptosis, but also blocks insulin production as we showed in a recent Nature Medicine paper. More importantly, we were able to demonstrate that genetic deletion of TICSNP protects against beta cell loss in diabetes. And what you can see in the upper hand uh, panel is uh, a model of type 1 diabetes that we induce with streptozotocin. And in gray, you can see the increase in blood glucose when uh, after the in induction of diabetes with streptozotocin in control lox lox mice. On the other hand, in the black uh, squares, you can see the blood glucose that remains stable in the beta cell-specific TICSNP knockout mice. And when we did a cross-section pseudopancreas, you can see that pretty much all islets with insulin-producing beta cells, insulin shown in blue, had been destroyed and were no longer present in the LOX LOX control mice, but nice round looking islets with plenty of insulin production, again shown in blue, were seen in the BTKO, which are the beta cell specific TICSNP knockout mice. When we quantified apoptosis by tunnel staining, as you can see in the lower panels, there were still apoptotic nuclei seen as bright green dots and marked with the yellow arrows uh, in the control mice but not in the TICSNP deficient knockout mice. And the quantification showed a more than 50% reduction in beta cells that were positive for tunnel staining, as you can see in the low black bar as opposed to the red bar. Obviously, that made us think that TICSNP would make a great therapeutic target, and we set out to find pharmacological ways to manipulate uh, TICSNP expression. And again, to make a long story short, we found that verapamil, which is an established blood pressure medication and calcium channel blocker, was capable of reducing TICSNP levels in mouse as well as human islets. And what we can see here is the dose-dependent decrease in TICSNP in response to verapamil in human islets. We then went on to repeat the experiments that I showed before in terms of genetic deletion of TICSNP by using verapamil. And interestingly, again, we were able to show 
that uh, verapamil treatment given after the induction of uh, diabetes by SDZ was capable of reducing and preventing the increase in blood glucose uh, as opposed to the mice receiving SDZ shown in the open white circles as opposed to uh, the black uh, bar, uh, squares. Again, in the cross section of the pancreas, you can see in the SDZ ones that uh, the beta cells had been destroyed. There's very little blue left of insulin uh, producing beta cells, but the mice that had received rapamil had still nice looking round eyelids with plenty of uh, insulin producing beta cells. And once again, looking at uh, apoptosis directly by tunnel staining, you can see a lot of tunnel positive nuclei in the mice that had received STZ, but not in the ones that had also received rapamil. And the quantification showed, again, a significant reduction in tunnel positive beta cells, as you can see by the black bar. More importantly, you, having a pharmacological tool to modulate TICSNP, we were able to address an even more important question, and that is, can we reverse diabetes after it had already started? Because ultimately, this is what we would see in patients in the clinic that, who come to us after they have developed diabetes and typically not before. And so what we did in this experiment, we waited 15 days till all the mice had become diabetic with blood glucose levels over 300 milligrams per deciliter, and only then started the verapamil treatment. Uh, in the green bars, you can see the control mice that did not receive verapamil, and their blood glucose got even worse within the last 10 days up to day 25, and reached almost 400 milligrams per deciliter. In contrast, the mice that received verapamil their blood glucose normalized and went back to uh, almost completely normal levels, again showing a significant difference. And that actually showed us that we can reverse even overt diabetes with the RAPMIL treatment and gave us a lot of hope that this truly could become a treatment. Uh, again, what we looked at is the cross section of the pancreas, and interestingly here we saw again that even after the beta cells had almost completely disappeared, as you can see in the SDZ panels, um, the upper one is the lower and the lower one the higher magnification, uh, there were still very nice looking insulin producing beta cells in the mice that had received verapamil after the onset of uh, diabetes, which makes it seem that those beta cells reappear even after they had been destroyed. The other important thing to uh, note here is that we were able to um, show an improvement in beta cell survival without impairing insulin secretion. And the reason I mention it is that, as you know, as a calcium channel blocker, verapamil could theoretically reduce insulin secretion by inhibiting um, the calcium flux and affecting the secretion process. However, Overall, we saw an increase in serum insulin levels in the animals that had received rapamil, demonstrating that the effect on insulin-producing beta cell mass by far outweighed any potential effect on the cellular level. So once again, we, with that, we had a pharmacological proof of concept and uh, a potentially novel approach to diabetes therapy that would promote the patient's own beta cell mass and insulin production. Now, you might say, how is it possible that this was not noticed before because rapamil is a commonly used blood pressure medication and diabetes is a very common disease? Now, the problem with a lot of the studies that have been done in terms of blood pressure medication is that diabetes is not an endpoint. Uh, it is more cardiovascular events, uh, death cases, uh, stroke, or uh, myocardial infarction. But there's been one in INVEST trial that actually looked at a different uh, blood pressure medications compared, and interestingly, what they found was that newly diagnosed diabetes was less frequent in the verapamil arm, and this was actually significant. So that was encouraging. And then more recently, uh, colleagues of ours, Yulia Kudneva um, and her uh, colleagues, did a retrospective study looking in a large cohort of patients with diabetes, almost 5,000 adults. Um, and looked at how did those do that were on calcium channel blockers and rapamil. And interestingly, they found that rapamil users had uh, serum glucose levels that were roughly 37 milligrams per deciliter lower than those that were not taking rapamil. 
And this was particularly the case in those that were also in insulin. So we're looking at the group of patients that have already problems with beta cells. Now that decrease or that lower blood glucose level is comparable to 1% lower hemoglobin A1C, which is classically what you would get with, with an established diabetes drug. So that is obviously very encouraging that Rathmill actually is helpful in humans as well, not just in the mouse model. So based on all those studies and with the help of a JDRF funded grant, we set out to do a clinical trial uh, called repurposing of a Rathmill as a beta cell survival therapy in type 1 diabetes. It's a double blind placebo controlled study and we are still recruiting adults age 18 to 45 years of age with new onset type 1 diabetes within the last three months. And once again, an important point here to take home is that type 1 diabetes can occur at any age. In fact, the oldest patient that I diagnosed with type 1 diabetes was 84 years of age. And we noticed that a lot of patients that come to us for the study actually have not been correctly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes just based on their age. Um, so we are planning to include 52 subjects who re will receive oral verapamil or placebo once a day for one year while continuing their regular insulin pump therapy. The primary endpoint will be functional beta cell mass that we measure by mixed meal stimulated C-peptide, which is a validated method in type 1 diabetes. And secondary endpoints will include insulin requirements and glucose control by a continuous glucose monitoring system or CGMS. Obviously, in addition, we're looking at several parameters uh, in terms of the research to try to uh, follow the natural course of the disease as well as any effects that the verapamil will have on these patients. In addition, we have an ongoing drug development program, and we're trying to uh, find specific tick SNP inhibitors through a high throughput screen. Because as great as uh, the preliminary data with the RAFML is, and it would be great because we would be able to translate it very quickly into the clinic since it's FDA approved and has been used safely in people for over 30 years, it is obviously not specific. It is a calcium channel blocker. So what we'd like to have is something that specifically targets uh, TICSNP. And so in collaboration with the Alabama Drug Discovery Alliance, as well as Southern Research Institute, we uh, went ahead and screened 300,000 small molecules, and we currently have multiple hits under investigation that look very promising as potential specific tick SNP inhibitors that we're hoping down the road will be able to enter into uh, clinical trials as well. So we're overall very excited about the future and what it will hold in terms of potentially uh, identifying novel treatments for diabetes primarily in this case with the trial type 1, but hopefully on the long run also type 2 diabetes. And with that, none of this would be possible without uh, our great colleagues in the UAB Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes and Metabolism, as well as the over 200 faculty members in our UAB Comprehensive Diabetes Center and logistical support from the Center for Clinical and Translational Science. Very central to all this is also the funding, the JDRF funding for the clinical trial, funding for our basic research program through NIH and specifically NIDDK, and through HERN, the Human Islet Research Network, a new effort from NIH um, that started this network. And we're very proud to be one of only five centers that have been selected to be part of the consortium on targeting and regeneration as part of this HERN CTAR program. And obviously the great team of collaborators and the participants of the clinical trial.